Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to Hayekadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of kings and Lord of lords, and the Holy Bible is our only standard and authority for truth. And together, God's people say, Hallelujah. Well, friends, I trust this finds you feeling blessed in Jesus this morning. Now, we're continuing our journey through the story of the Bible, and we've been in the story of Joseph, his 11 brothers, his selling into Egypt, his exaltation as second in command over all of Egypt, the seven years of plenty having passed in the midst of the seven years of famine. Joseph's brothers have come back to Egypt to gather food to take back to their family in Canaan. And Joseph, upon recognizing them, has laid out this deceptive plan to exact vengeance upon his brothers for what they did unto him. And that's where we pick up today in chapter 45. Now let's recap for a moment chapter 44. Benjamin has been found with the silver cup, Joseph's silver cup, which is a precious item of Joseph's. It's the very cup in which he drinks from. The brothers had said, whosoever you find the cup with, let him be killed. And now they are pleading for Benjamin's life to Joseph. And chapter 45 verse 1 says, Joseph at this point could not refrain himself any longer. And so he told everyone in the room to leave. And there was left none standing with Joseph, only his 11 brothers. And Joseph made himself known unto his brothers. And the Bible says in verse 2, he wept so loud that everyone in Pharaoh's palace, everyone in the house of Pharaoh heard his weeping. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father alive? Notice the first thing that he wants to ensure is that his father is still alive. And his brethren could not answer him, for they were troubled at his presence. Well, obviously, he is second in command of all of Egypt. What is he about to do to them to repay them? Now, although this plan has been a little bit of vengeance on Joseph's part for what they did, notice what Joseph says. He says, come near to me, I beg you. And they came near. And he said, look at me, I am Joseph, your brother. Look past the clothing, look past the beard, look past the makeup. I am Joseph, your brother. You sold me into Egypt, but do not grieve yourself for this. Do not be angry with yourselves. For it was God who sent me before you to preserve your lives to keep the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob alive so that the promise of God would be true. For two years the famine has been in the land, and there are still five to come. But God has sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it was not you that sold me into slavery. It was the hand of God at work. And God has taken me from a slave's position, and he's made me a father to Pharaoh. He's made me lord over all of Pharaoh's house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. In other words, Joseph is saying, do you remember that dream when you hated me in your hearts because I told you that the dream said you would bow down unto me? Well, you're seeing this come true before your very eyes. Now, don't spend a lot of time trying to figure this out. Get up. Go get my father. Say unto him, thy son Joseph, God has made Lord over all of Egypt. Come down unto me and tarry not. There's some explaining to do. The brothers now have to go back to their father Jacob and explain how they lied, explain what they did, and bring their father back to the land of Egypt so that they will survive the next five years of the famine. Joseph says you will dwell in the land of Goshen and you will be near to me so that I can see you and I can see your children and your children's children. I can see your flock. I can visit with you. We can make up for all the lost time since I have been separated from you, my family. 
And whatever I was going to do as payback, that's behind us. From this day forward, I will nourish you. I will take care of you. I will love you. I will treat you respectfully. I will treat you honorably. You and all you have. And when you speak to my father in verse 13, tell him of my position here. Tell him of all you see. And then Joseph fell upon Benjamin's neck and he wept. And Benjamin wept upon his neck. And he kissed all his brothers, all 11 of them. Joseph had forgiven them because he understood that it was the hand of God that was at work. His brothers were not to blame. They were only the tools that had been used in order for the work of God to be done. And notice it says, after that, his brethren talked with him. I'm sure they did. They had a lot to talk about. And Joseph put all the pieces together for them. And that ride back to Canaan to go get their father had to be full of amazement and wonder as they discussed among themselves what had happened, how they played a role in it, and ultimately how God is fulfilling his plan. And this became known throughout all of Pharaoh's house. And it pleased Pharaoh and all his servants. So Pharaoh said unto Joseph, tell your brothers, go down into the land of Canaan. Gather your family, your father, your household, come back, and I will give you the good of the land of Egypt, and you will eat from the fat of the land. In other words, I will treat your family with the same royalty that I treat you, Joseph. Take wagons, many wagons from the land of Egypt for your little ones, your wives. Bring your father and come. Don't think about what you're leaving behind, for everything that Egypt has to offer is yours. And so Joseph's 11 brothers did so. Joseph gave them changes of raiment in verse 22 or extra clothes for their journey. But unto Benjamin, he gave 300 pieces of silver and five changes of raiment. And he said unto them, as you travel, see that you fall not out by the way. Stay on the straight and narrow. Stay on the course. Make sure nothing diverts your attention from the goal at hand. Now, friends, we can learn a lot from this because our goal is to meet the Lord Jesus. Our goal is to live with him eternally forever under his rule and reign in an eternal state of rest and peace and joy and love and goodness and kindness and mercy, the way things originally were intended to be. And we need to allow nothing to divert our attention from our goal. We need to be forever reminded what our goal is. And we need to remain steadfast in pursuing that goal and allow nothing to distract us. Well, in verse 25, the brothers did just that. They left Egypt. They came into the land of Canaan and to Jacob, their father. And they told Jacob, saying, Joseph is yet alive. Now, like I said, there's much explaining to be done here. And you have to remember, Jacob has been a deceiver his entire life. And so he too is receiving a little bit of payback, reaping what he has sown through this devious plot that was set forth by these 11 brothers, or specifically 10 brothers, because Benjamin wasn't involved. Well, they told Jacob, Joseph is governor over all the land of Egypt. And Jacob's heart fainted, for he didn't believe them. And so they told him all the words of Joseph. Do you remember? Back in verse 15 of chapter 45, it says his brethren talked with him. Well, all they discussed, all they learned from Joseph, they told unto Jacob. And Jacob, when he saw the wagons which Joseph had sent to carry him and his family, when he saw all the goods they had brought from Egypt, his spirit revived within him. And Jacob said, that is enough. My son is alive. I will go and see him before I die. Now in chapter 46, verse one, it says, as they make their journey toward Egypt, they came into Beersheba and Jacob offered sacrifices unto the God of his father, Isaac. Jacob is overjoyed because he's starting to see the plan of God in a bigger picture. And he's starting to see how the promise of God unto his fathers, Abraham and Isaac, are being fulfilled. 
And God spake unto Jacob in the visions of the night and said, Jacob, and Jacob said, here am I. And he said, I am God, the God of your father. Do not fear going down into Egypt, for I will make of you there a great nation. And I will be with you in Egypt, and I will bring you up again, and you will enjoy many days with your son Joseph. And so Jacob rose up from Beersheba, He took all his cattle, all his goods, which he had gotten in the land of Canaan, and he came into Egypt. He with his sons and his sons' sons with him and his daughters and his sons' daughters and all of his seed brought he with him into Egypt. And as he enters into the land of Egypt, he comes upon Goshen and Joseph made ready his chariot, went up to meet Israel, his father in verse 29, and he presented himself unto him. And he fell on his neck, and he wept on his neck a good while. And Jacob said unto his son Joseph, Now let me die, since I have seen thy face, because I know that you are alive. And Joseph said unto his brother, and unto all in his father's house, I will go up and show Pharaoh, and say unto him, My brother and my father's house, which were in the land of Canaan, are now here in Egypt with me. And the men are shepherds, for their trade has been to feed cattle. They have brought their flocks and their herds and all that they have. And it will come to pass when Pharaoh will call you, he will say, what is your occupation? And you will say unto Pharaoh, your servant's trade has been about cattle from our youth even until now. It's all that we've ever known. And so let us remain in the land of Goshen as shepherds and farmers because every shepherd is an abomination unto the Egyptians. So basically they're saying they don't want to live in the city of Egypt, the kingdom of Egypt. They want to live on the outskirts. They want to live out in the plains, in the farming areas, and they want to remain a simple people. And most likely this is because they've understood what we have discussed in past, that God always intended his people to be in the plains. The city is the invention of man and the work of devils where evil increases much. So in chapter 47, verse 1, it says, Joseph came and he told Pharaoh and he says, my brothers and my family is here, my father with them. They have brought everything they own, their cattle and everything from Canaan. And they are now at this moment in Goshen. And Pharaoh said unto them in verse 3, what is your occupation? And they said that we are shepherds both we and our fathers, and we have come to sojourn in the land, but we have no pasture for our flocks. The famine is great in the land of Canaan, and so we ask of thee that you would let your servants dwell in the land of Goshen. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph in verse 6, the land of Egypt is before thee. In the best of the land, make your father and your brethren to dwell. If the land of Goshen is what they desire, give it unto them. And not only let them rule their own cattle, but let them rule over my cattle. And Joseph in verse 7 brings his father in to meet Pharaoh. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh. And Pharaoh looking upon Jacob says, how old are you? And Jacob said, the days of my years and my pilgrimage are 130 years. Few and evil have the days of the years of my life been. My fathers before me live longer and happier days, but my days have been full of unhappiness, misery, and evil. And once again, Jacob blessed Pharaoh. Now in verse 11, Joseph placed his father and his brothers. In other words, he settled them in their new homeland. He gave them a possession in the land of Egypt, the best of the land, the best that the land had to offer. And he did this with Pharaoh's approval. And Joseph cared for his family. He nourished his father, his brothers, and all that were in their household. And we're going to close there today, friends. But as we close, look at the heart of Joseph. He had every reason to sentence his brothers to a life of misery and suffering. And yet he forgave them. And he did so because of his relationship with the Almighty. He understood, even though it hadn't been recorded yet, all things work together by God for our good because God is behind the scenes and he is the one that is structuring the course of our lives. And even what appears to be 
the most painful situations for us, God is using to bring about his ultimate glory. And so let us too look beyond the circumstances of this life, the people of this life, and let us be very careful not to point the finger or blame anyone for the events that have taken place in our lives, but let us remind ourselves and remember that no matter what happens to us, God is ultimately in control. And the question is, how faithful will we remain in our hearts, in our minds, unto God, and trust Him in all things, no matter what comes our way? Oh, friends, as you have seen, there are so many lessons that we can take from this story, from the life of Joseph. We can learn what to do as we look at Joseph and we can learn what not to do as we look at the lives of his and the choices of his brothers. We even see mercy being extended from a pagan ruler. And yet, even though these individuals feel like they're exercising free will, God is behind the scenes directing each and every one of their choices so that ultimately he will receive all the glory and praise and his perfect plan will come to fruition will be fulfilled upon the earth in which we live. Friends, may the trust in your God be strengthened through this story. May your eyes be opened. May your understanding be enlightened. And even in the most desperate of times, maybe even death itself, may you rely upon the hand and the promise of God, confidently knowing that all things, good and bad, work together for your good. Now, as he wills and until tomorrow, friends, I truly love you. Keep fighting the good fight. Stand strong in your trust and faith. And then watch as the Lord works in and through your life as he did through the life of Joseph. Now, as he wills and until tomorrow, friends, I'll see you on the next video.